The Pixies, much like the Melvins, were one of those bands who got popular right at the cradle of grunge. Even more than that, they'd both be considered a major influence on the alternative rock bands who followed in their footsteps. In a 1994 interview with Rolling Stone magazine, Kurt Cobain from Nirvana admitted that he was trying to emulate the Pixie style, revealing, I was trying to write the ultimate pop song. I was basically trying to rip off the Pixies. We used their sense of dynamics, being soft and quiet, and then loud and hard. Today, let's take a look at whatever happened to the Pixies. From the earliest days of the band, there was always tension over creative control between band leader Black Francis and bassist Kim Deal. Born Charles Michael Kittredge Thompson IV, frontman Black Francis moved a lot around America, spending time in both California and Southern Massachusetts. His first musical performance would be done at a young age as part of a hippie collective. And he had a pretty normal childhood, riding his skateboards, spending time at the mall and the beach. And Thompson would start writing songs around the age of 12, telling Spin Magazine, there were a couple songs like Here Comes Your Man, which I wrote when I was 14 or 15. So some early Pixie songs had their roots in my teen years, but they didn't crystallize into something until I heard the Violent Femmes or Iggy Pop record. And then I was like, oh, okay. Bassist Kim Deal, meanwhile, would grow up in Ohio as the daughter of a coal miner, and she would pick up guitar at age 13, only after her father started taking lessons. She decided to give it a shot, and she learned pretty quickly. Her father, though, never learned to play the guitar. Kim would start writing songs with her sister Kelly, but at that time in Ohio, they had trouble getting into a band because girls typically didn't play rock music in high school. So the pair started playing truck stops instead, and even got an opportunity to open once for the Allman Brothers. The Pixies' origins dated back to 1983 at the University of Massachusetts Amherst when Thompson met guitarist Joey Santiago. Santiago would grow up in the Philippines and move to the States at age 6, and would play in different bands in high school. Thompson was majoring in anthropology while Santiago was studying economics. They began to jam together and attend concerts, including some punk rock shows. It was during this time Thompson showed Santiago a few songs he had written, including UMass and Levitate Me. Thompson would be the principal songwriter in the Pixies and would be heavily influenced by Captain Beefheart, Iggy Pop, and Husker Du. During their second year together, Thompson went to Puerto Rico as part of a student exchange. He would spend six months in the U.S. territory studying at the island's main public university. And Thompson had also a budding interest in astronomy, and after his exchange was up, he had two choices, go to New Zealand to see Halley's Comet or head back to college. He returned to Amherst, and due to his and Santiago's boredom with college, they opted to drop out and start a band together. Thompson would tell Spin Magazine, University is a big fairy bubble where no one knows shit about anything. Everything rubbed me the wrong way, whether it was a social interaction with other kids, or people formulating their intellectual outlook on the universe. Everyone was so full of themselves, he'd say. One day prior to their withdrawal deadline, the pair dropped out of college so they could recoup their tuition money. They soon moved to Boston where they continued to write music together while working at a warehouse to pay the bills. By January of 1986, Thompson and Santiago were in need of a bass player and drummer. They would place an ad in the Boston Phoenix that read, Band Seeks Bassist into Husker Du and Peter, Paul and Mary, Please No Chops. Kim Deal was the only person who responded to the ad, even though she only played guitar. She would recall to spin, I went over to meet Joe and Charles. I thought Joe was a Mexican when I first met him. He didn't talk much. But Charles played this song in acoustic called Brick is Red, and I liked it. And inspired by the band, she decided to learn bass. Ahead of joining the Pixies, Deal at the time was married to a computer programmer who she had met back home in Ohio, but the couple opted to move to her husband's hometown of Boston. Boston was also attractive to Deal because people were less hung up about playing with girls in bands. After moving to Boston, Deal had taken up a job at a doctor's office working in a lab telling Spin, I love the microscope and cellular biology. If you gave a stool sample, I'd be the one swabbing it on a plate of agar and seeing what grows. Initially, Deal recommended her sister Kelly to join as the group's drummer, but things wouldn't work out as Kelly wasn't as confident in her drumming abilities. Deal would end up recommending a friend of her husband's, a drummer named David Lovering, who she met at her wedding reception. She remembered Lovering because he wore a pinstripe suit. Lovering at the time had given up drumming, but after hearing the band's music, he joined the group. The quartet soon started jamming in Lovering's parents' garage, and the sound that the Pixies was developing was really difficult to characterize, combining elements of punk and surf rock. 
and they soon became known for their loud, quiet, loud dynamics, which many other bands copied. Thompson would tell Guitar.com, The music is unconventional. There's a lot of half-steps, a lot of chords that don't theoretically go with the key, but it seems to work. Thompson would also reject a lot of what was considered mainstream at the time, especially hair metal bands, only really being impressed with their speed and nothing else. Originally calling themselves Pixies and Panoply, they quickly shortened their name to simply Pixies. The name came to Santiago, who still sometimes struggled with English, and would often refer to the dictionary to look up certain words. One day he was flipping through the dictionary and came across the word Pixies, whose definition read mischievous little elves. The Pixies soon booked their first live gig in September of 1986 at a club in Cambridge, who spelled their name the Puxies. While their first couple gigs were a little rough, by the late summer and early fall of that year, they started earning a name for themselves in the Boston club scene. A bulk of the band's setlist for those shows consisted of their first two records, and the band also stood out for the way they advertised their gigs using posters that read Death to the Pixies with a naked Thompson on the advertisement. Julie Farman, who booked local gigs for Boston bands, told Spin, The big local bands were Mission of Burma, The Neats, The Lairs, and Del Fuegos. There was this hierarchy of the Boston scene. These were bands who played locally and came up through the clubs and really worked it, and earned it, and hung out. The Pixies were not part of that scene. They came out of nowhere, she'd remember. Also happening at that time was that a lot of the bands in the Boston scene were derivative of whatever was popular at the time. So while bands like the Smiths were popular in the 80s, there would be a Boston version of the Smiths. The Pixies didn't fit into that mold sounding like nobody else. One Boston musician would recall to spin, man if this shit takes off my career is over. The Pixies first caught the attention of a local producer while opening for Throwing Muses in December of 1986. It would be the first time both bands were on the same bill, At that gig was a local producer and Fort Apache studio owner named Gary Smith who saw the Pixies for the first time and was blown away. He begged the band to let him record them, and according to their future label 4AD, Smith was quoted as telling the band he could not sleep until you guys are world famous. Thompson's father would finance a 17-track demo known to fans as the Purple Tape at a cost of about $1,000 at Smith's recording studio. The tape was recorded over the course of three days during the winter in March of 1987, with members staying up the whole time drinking Jolt Cola. Smith would recall the Purple Tape sessions telling the magazine, I remember people wearing snorkel jackets while doing parts, people wearing gloves while playing guitar. When we finally had the whole thing mixed and ready, we were in my apartment and I was doing the artwork for the cassette. Francis's time spent in Puerto Rico, as well as growing up with fundamentalist Christian parents, would influence several of the tracks found on their demo. And following that session, Thompson adopted the name Black Francis, while Kim used the alias Mrs. John Murphy. Thompson would reveal why he used the name, telling Spin, I wanted a stage name. It was a punk rock thing. I've since learned it has a much longer history, mostly in black blues music. But for me, it was, if it's good enough for Iggy Pop, it's good enough for me. Meanwhile, Deal chose the name Mrs. John Murphy after she interacted with a woman who wanted to be called by her husband's name as a form of respect. It would be Kristen Hirsch of Throwing Muses who begged the band's manager, Ken Goes, to sign the band, and he managed to get the band's demo tape over to the English label 4AD, who the Cocteau twins were signed to. Up until this point, the Pixies demo had been rejected by numerous labels, including Electra, Slash, SST, Relativity, Homestead, Throbbing Lobster, and New Rose, and 4AD almost passed on the band as well, but it would be Ivo Watts Russell's girlfriend who persuaded him to sign the band. 4AD chose to take 8 tracks from the group's demo and release it as a mini LP called Come On Pilgrim. The song was created a bit of tension with the Pixies as well as their producer of the demo, as they felt it wasn't the best representation of the group, while also wondering what would happen with the remaining tracks. Released in September of 1987, Come On Pilgrim earned a lot of praise in the UK, while also peaking at number 5 on the UK indie albums charts. The band also started to get airplay on college radio stateside, and to support the release the band hit the road touring in America in cities they hadn't previously played. Once they got off the road they were given a budget of $10,000 by their label, and the Pixies in December of 1987 hooked up with an up and coming producer named Steve Albini for their first full length LP titled Surfer Rosa. The sessions were pretty harmonious with Albini admitting that up until this point in his career, he'd only produced his own bands and his friends' bands. His sessions with the Pixies would be the first time he was working with four complete strangers. 
Albini only took a fee of $1,500 for his services and opted not to take any royalties off album sales, which producers are typically entitled to. It was something which he continued to stand by his entire career, as he saw it as an insult to the band. Surfer Rosa would be recorded in just 10 days, with Albini later admitting the band could have been done in 7 days, but they spent a few extra days experimenting with different sounds. And during the recording of the album, Albini utilized some unorthodox recording techniques, including recording studio banter between the members, which made it onto the album, in addition to the fact that Kim's vocals were recorded in the studio bathroom on the tracks Gigantic and Where Is My Mind to achieve a more, and I quote, roomy echo. While the tension between Black Francis and Kim Deal wouldn't reach a boiling point until years later, it seemed to start with the single Gigantic, with Deal telling Spin, when journalists used to say things like, why doesn't Kim sing more, Charles would leave the table. But he would respond back in the same interview, revealing, I have an ego. You have to have an ego to do this. At the time, we would be playing and I would say to myself, I'm doing all the work, she's smoking a cigarette and the crowd is loving her. Why am I knocking myself out writing all these damn songs? Released in 1988, Surfer Rosa garnered much praise overseas in Europe and was awarded Album of the Year by UK Music Mag's Melody Maker and Sounds, while the response stateside was positive but more muted. It may have had something to do with the fact that 4AD didn't have a big distributor stateside and Surfer Rosa wasn't that widely available. Spin Magazine, however, did name the Pixies Musicians of the Year and referred to the album as, and I quote, beautifully brutal. The album spent over a year on the UK indie albums charts, peaking at number 4, and almost two decades after its release, it seemed to have caught on in America as the album finally went gold by the middle of the 2000s. The track Where Is My Mind would also be used in the movie Fight Club and raise the band's profile. Surfer Rosa would be hugely influential in shaping the sound of so-called grunge bands who shot to popularity years later in the early 90s, and even musician David Bowie found himself a fan of the album, saying, and I quote, it's the most compelling music outside of Sonic Youth made in the entire 80s. Producer Steve Albini, though, revealed in a 2006 oral history of the band called Fool the World that he never really got what all the fuss was about when it came to the Pixies, saying, I never really got to that level of interest with the Pixies. It's awkward for me to say, it's because I feel like in some way I'm peeing on their birthday cake here. To support the album, the Pixies journeyed to Europe in the spring of 1988 to open for Throwing Muses, but halfway through the tour, the Pixies started to draw a bigger crowd and they soon were the headliner. The band headed back into the studio, this time with producer Gil Norton, who they met on tour. Norton would produce a majority of the group's work going forward, and 4AD allotted a budget of about $30,000, as well as three weeks of studio time. Francis focused on biblical themes with a bigger focus on the Old Testament, and the resulting album would be Doolittle, which was released in April of 1989. By this point in time, 4AD had signed a US distribution deal with major label Elektra, and the album once again garnered positive praise, and with the help of the major label, the band finally received more airplay in America, with the singles Here Comes Your Man and Monkey Gone to Heaven both charting in the top 5 on the US mainstream rock tracks chart. The singles also did pretty well in the UK, as the band released an additional single, Debaser. Years down the road, Doolittle would eventually be released as downloadable content in the video game Rock Band in 2008, and for me, it was my first proper introduction to the band. Doolittle would end up going platinum in America, and while the band had a lot to celebrate, the creative relationship between Deal and Francis began to sour even further. Deal wanted more say in the creative process while Francis pushed back. The touring cycle with Doolittle was fraught with tension, as Francis allegedly threw a guitar at Deal during a concert in Germany and the next day she refused to play at the band's next show and was almost fired from the Pixies. Francis claimed to Spin Magazine he did in fact kick the guitar at Kim because she showed up an hour late to a sold out gig. Regardless, the pair soon stopped talking altogether and traveled separately from each other on the road. By the fall of 1989, the Pixies took a much needed break. Francis moved out west to LA and did a short solo tour for gas money while Lovering and Santiago went on vacation. It was during this time Deal came to realize that she needed to start her own group to get her creative ideas out. Deal would soon start the outfit The Breeders and they would record their debut album Pod in 1990 with producer Steve Albini. And Albini admittedly liked their music more than the Pixies. Side note guys, I've done a whole video on the history of The Breeders, the link is down below. It was during the making of The Breeders album in early 1990 that the band was in the UK. Meanwhile, the remaining members of the Pixies had moved across the country to Los Angeles and started working again with producer Gil Norton. 
By the time Dio returned to America, she was shocked to learn her bandmates had moved out west without telling her. She soon spoke to Francis who told her he didn't want her to come to California, but she did so anyways. Upon arriving in Los Angeles, the band's manager told Kim where to meet the band the next day, and it would turn out he had given her the address to a lawyer's office. The band had decided to finally fire Deal, but by the end of their meeting, they backed down and she was still in the band. Francis would tell Spin, First of all, a lot of the so-called tension and negativity within the band that people have alluded to over the years is much exaggerated. It was almost first upon us because people were looking for it. The band actually got along fine, he would say. But the band's former tour manager, Chaz Banks, would echo Francis' sediment with Deal's attitude, saying she was very lax when it came to being professional and on time. By February of 1990, the band recorded their follow-up, Bossa Nova, which represented a more mellow direction for the band and was inspired by Francis' fascination with science fiction and UFOs. The band had little time to rehearse the songs as Francis wrote them mostly in the studio. And released in August of 1990, the album, while criticized by some for being too mellow, was mostly praised and received a good amount of airplay on alternative rock radio. The tour to support the album saw the quartet headline the 1990 Reading Festival, with Lovering remembering, that was our first big headlining thing. That was probably the most money we made for a gig at the time. We played a secret gig the night before at a little pub in Reading. Following the Reading Festival, the band toured with David Bowie and Australian band Midnight Oil, playing massive stadiums in Europe. Following the tour, the band would head back into the studio and release their final album with Deal, titled Trompe Le Monde, in September of 1991. The album would be largely overshadowed by the plethora of releases that month with bands like Guns N' Roses, Nirvana, Metallica, R.E.M., and many others putting out albums around this time. Deal would also play a much smaller role in the studio with producer Gil Norton recalling to spin. Kim's presence got less every time, especially when we did Trompe Le Monde. I wasn't happy by the end of that because there was one song that I thought was perfect for her to sing. Charles didn't want her to sing it. He definitely didn't want her to have a big imprint on the songs. The tour to support the album offered the band a pretty big opportunity. U2 was on their Zoo TV tour and it originally asked Nirvana and Nine Inch Nails to open for them, but both bands declined, so the Pixies got the offer and they accepted. They would play the biggest audiences of their career, but the band didn't seem to enjoy the tour. Tensions between Deal and Francis, in addition to the fact that American audiences were lukewarm to the band's live shows, hampered their life on the road. Author Michael Azarad, who attended the Madison Square Garden show, recalled to Spin, There was no life in the Pixies set. I walked out incredibly disappointed, thought this is where they really crack it in the US and the goods were not there anymore. While Francis would tell the LA Times in 1992 his experience on the road with U2 saying, Everyone was all excited about it and I admit I was too, but the record company was acting like we were going to sell a million records and of course it didn't happen. It was good, you know. I would never want to say anything that would reflect badly on U2, like it was boring, but it was boring. It had nothing to do with them or the way we were treated. You know, all those places where they play basketball or hockey are similarly designed and after a while it's cement building after cement building. The Pixies would play their final show in April of 1992 in Vancouver, Canada, and after the tour they decided to take a long break. But in January of 1993, Francis gave an interview to BBC Radio 5 where he announced the band was over without really providing any details. It was shortly after that interview Francis broke the news to Santiago over the phone and allegedly faxed Deal and Lovering to break the news. Whether he actually faxed the other members has been disputed by several people, and Deal at the time was recording the Breeders' sophomore record Last Splash, which would be the group's biggest record. Following the Pixies' breakup, Black Francis rebranded himself as Frank Black and released a number of solo albums with his backing band, The Catholics. Santiago stayed loyal to Francis playing guitar on several of his albums. Lovering, for his part, initially passed up the opportunity to play drums in Foo Fighters and instead became a magician, even creating his own style of magic called scientific phenomenalism. Deal, meanwhile, will continue with the Breeders while also forming the band The Amps, who put out a single record. In 2003, Francis called Santiago to see if he was interested in reforming the Pixies, and by 2004, the band was back together doing a full-scale reunion tour. The same year, a Best Of album came out, and the band released a new song in Bam Thwok, which was written and sung by Deal. The track was initially rejected for the Shrek 2 soundtrack. While many fans thought we'd see an album of new material, the band continued to tour for the next nine years or so, really not putting out any new material. In 2009, the band launched a tour to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the album Doolittle by playing the album in its entirety in addition to its B-sides. 
Once again, the tensions between Deal and Francis boiled over, as in 2013 it was announced that she had left the band. Deal announced she was leaving the Pixies at the time to concentrate on making new material with the Breeders. It just so happened to coincide with the fact that the Breeders classic lineup from the 90s had gotten back together in 2013 to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the group's album Last Splash. Black Francis would give an interview to the newspaper The Guardian shortly after Deal's departure saying the following, she's been reticent for a very long time to make a new Pixies record. She was unhappy with the situation, or unhappy with her life or whatever, just not happy. Two weeks after Deal's departure, the Pixies would release a new song that didn't feature Deal called Bag Boy that was made available free on the band's website. The band would announce that bassist Kim Shattuck would be Deal's replacement for the summer of 2013 during their tour across Europe, but she would end up being fired by the band several months later, with Francis citing personality conflicts and her bass playing. She would end up passing away shortly after her departure, and it was said that she had been diagnosed with ALS two years prior. Shattuck would be replaced by Paz Lane Shanton, and the band would release a series of EPs in late 2013, early 2014, titled EPs 1, 2, and 3, and they would be combined as part of one album called Indie Cindy a year later. The band would release 2016's Head Carrier, which received mixed reviews, and the band would release their most recent album, 2019's Beneath the Airy, which was accompanied by a podcast documenting the making of the album. As recently as 2020, Black Francis gave an interview to Grunge Online, where he discussed his working relationship with Kim Deal, saying, Kim and I just didn't get along well after a time. She'd always had her own ambitions and became comfortable in the leadership role in her other band. It must have been hard for her to be in a band where some other guy was always pulling at the reins, he'd say. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again on Rock and Roll True Stories. Take care.